Welcome to the WRL Daily Download. I'm Julian Grace, and today's deep dive conversation is with Five On Your Side reporter Keely Arthur, who is here to talk about how to hire the right person to repair your home after a storm. Now, this discussion is very timely. We are in hurricane season until the end of November 30th, and it's just not about hurricanes, right? Because the triangle constantly faces severe weather. Keely, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you, Julian. All right. uh, A storm comes through. I step outside. I have damage to my home. What should be my first step? Well, if you're not in immediate danger, there's obviously if you're in if you're in danger, leave the area, get away from it. But if you are looking outside and you see something's happened, you want to get pictures of that right away. And then your next call should be to your insurance company. And then finally, if you can, tarp things off and kind of just like put things, get get a hold of the damage if you're not looking at like down power lines or anything that's very dangerous. Pictures. Why are pictures so important? Because it paints a clear picture of what exactly has happened. That way you can say, you can back up whatever you're going to tell the insurance agent. Hey, a tree fell down in front of my house. I'm, I have photos of this. And it's just a great way to document things. Five on your side, we know that as the consumer kind of brand, you have to have documents and records of everything. That is so key in all these situations. We also see um, after every major storm, contractors going door to door, knocking on each house. Why should I be wary of people showing up on my doorstep saying, hey, I can fix your home. Yeah, that they actually have a name. They're called fly-by-night contractors. They kind of come out of nowhere and almost are attracted to these uh, disaster situations. You need to be wary of them because, unfortunately, it's an emotional time. We're, we're stressed. We have damage to our home. We want to fix it and probably aren't thinking as logically maybe as we would be if it was just a normal day and you didn't have to deal with this damage. So scammers, as we know, always prey upon emotions. And so that is why it's so important to be really wary of people who kind of see your damage as an opportunity for themselves. But sometimes the deals just seem so good though, right? They do. But I I don't know if a deal sounds too good to be true. It probably is. I mean, there's so many times where people that we've talked to think, oh, well, you know, he said he was going to do it at half the price. Well, that's a huge red flag. Repairs and renovations all have a cost associated with them, and a legitimate contractor is going to go through that plan, tell you how much it is, and be and be a realistic about it. A good deal is not necessarily a good deal. How can we manage that emotional component? Like you said, my house is damaged. I just want it fixed. I'm stressed. The kids are running around. Someone please help me. Yeah. I always like to arm myself with knowledge. So maybe you pull up the WRL articles on this topic or you listen to this podcast and you kind of sit there and think, okay, I'm going to make this checklist. So your insurance company is probably going to ask you to get multiple quotes any bit, anyway from a contractor if you have damage to your home from a storm or any other weather event. And you're going to get multiple of those quotes. And then from there, you need to ask your potential contractor things like, are you licensed here? How are you going to handle permitting in this area? Have you worked with insurance companies before? How long have you been in the area? To your point about these people that just show up, you want them to know the area that they're working in. So you want to ask them, how long have you been here um, if they're if they're mainly doing work outside of the state, you probably should not do business with them. Why is that? Because they don't know the state regulations. In North Carolina, in a lot of cases, you have to be permitted in the state. And then different municipalities have different permitting. And then also, you want someone who's going to be available and in the area and know um, subcontractors that are also local. So you want that local expert. There's a lot of documentation that is involved. What type of documents should I ask specifically if I say, I like this contractor. Mm -hmm. I did some of the checks and balances that Keely suggested. What documents should I ask for? You should make sure that they're licensed and you can look that up online. You can easily search. You can type in Google, you know, North Carolina contractor licensing and pull that up. 
any contractor who's doing more than $30,000 worth of work in North Carolina must have a license. But even if it's less than that, you should try to work with a contractor who is licensed. You want to make sure that they also have liability and compensation insurance. So that way, if somebody that um, they employ is injured while they're working on your project, you're not footing the bill for that. And I know that, you know, you're asking for the license. You're asking how they're insured. You're asking who they've worked with before. Right. It's all these things. And it seems like it's unnecessary until something happens down the road and you think, oh, sh- shoot, I should have asked mm-hmm. if they are licensed. It's simple, and a, a legitimate contractor is going to be very willing to give you that information. All right. Say, for instance, I don't get a contractor that comes to my door just knocking. I don't know a good contractor. How do I find a good contractor? So something that we try to tell people is do some work ahead of time. I know that storms pop up um, and they can feel very abrupt. But as you pointed out, the triangle is always dealing with severe weather. So if you have a good friend who's having their kitchen renovated or something else done with their home, ask them, hey, do you like who you're working with? How have they been to you? Are they responsive? Do you think they're reliable? Are they quoting you and then sticking with that price? Or do you feel like they're overcharging you? So it's good to talk to people ahead of time. And that way have like a list of people that you can call on when the damage does happen and you need someone to see you immediately. I mean, Google is a great thing too, but you need to also make sure you're you're getting references from people you trust. So word of mouth still works in this situation? It totally does because you can talk you can talk to a friend who says, "Yes, this person worked really well or they didn't." We had a situation once for Five on Your Side where a gentleman had a lot of issues as a contractor, ran into some legal problems, actually went to jail, and then he he changed his name and he was working on a, a totally different name. So people can get really crafty when it comes to scamming. You want to say, hey, Julian, did you work with this person? Did you like them? Ask a trusted friend. Right. That's really the key. I love that advice. All right, Keely, we will pause right there. When we come back from the break, Five on Your Side reporter Keely Arthur, we all want to talk about can you pay a contractor too early? All right, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the WRL Daily Download. I'm talking with Five on Your Side reporter Keely Arthur. And Keely, can you pay a contractor too early? You can. They're going, they're a business. They're going to ask for money. You want to make sure first and foremost, after you do all the thing, all the vetting, you want to make sure that you get a quote from them, a list of the items they're going to use. And then when they come onto the job, Make sure that they're using the materials and things that they quoted you for. So just keep an eye on that. Ooh, how hard is that to verify that? You know, I think that it it shouldn't be too difficult. If you're discussing a certain type of wood and, you're, and you can ask. I mean, I'm not somebody who's constantly doing home renovations. You can say, what type of wood is that? Mm-hmm during the quoting process and then they can and then you you see it you say okay I just want to verif- verify this is the same material or the same roofing material because all of this I mean you can buy really cheap materials and it'll look okay but you really need to ask them yeah make sure it's the right kind of material mm. so that's how you do that they're probably going to charge you at for that um quote and that initial kind of look over the property they're going to ask for some money for that. And that's okay. But you want to pay as you go. And it's this kind of trust. So you're going to give them a little bit and they're going to work. And you're going to give them a little bit more and they're going to work. You never want to give huge sums of money up front. We've had a lot of situations where people say, oh, yeah, just pay me $5,000 and we'll, you know, we'll do, do the whole thing and just pay up front and it'll be done. You never, you'll never see work. In a lot of cases, people will just leave. Mm. So um, for bigger projects, a good rule of thumb is no more than 20%. So $10,000 project, no more than 20% up front. Because 
materials cost money. They're going to need money to to buy those things, but you got to be really careful. I think sometimes we forget whenever there's a storm that trees can be a major headache and a big factor. Absolutely. I kind of, with Hurricane Ian, realized this. I'm not from North Carolina. I'm from the Midwest. We are do not live in the city of Oaks in uh, the Chicagoland area. And with all these storms, I mean, even trees that are alive and well get knocked down because the wind is so strong. And so that's something you you see in the aftermath for sure. You spoke a lot about documentation and keeping documentation. Why should I keep my receipts and insurance payments? Because that way you can always go back. The paperwork, the math doesn't lie. You can say, you can reference back to things and say, hey, this is what we discussed and this isn't what I'm seeing. You can always hold people accountable. And then it takes some of the emotion out of it too. Money is very emotional. And if you have a receipt and you have a contract, you can reference back to that instead of saying, well, you know, we had this conversation. No, always have it in writing. Does the writing process, having it in writing, are contractors obligated to obey or follow those guidelines? They can, if they breach a contract, then they're in breach of the contract and you can get, you know, lawyers involved and do all of that. I mean, yeah, a contract is typically legally binding. In some of the situations that we've handled where there were scams, you know, I've I've asked, why why wouldn't this person be charged criminally? And it's normally because they're in violation of a contract, which makes it a civil situation versus a criminal one. I'm about to make my final payment to the contractor who just finished my house. Before I make that final payment, because you said sometimes contractors, once you make that payment, they're gone. That's it. What should I be doing around my house to make sure everything was done properly? Maybe give it some time. You know, the thing about these home renovations or fixing the situation that was damaged from the storm, it takes a second to see, oh, was like this, the grouting laid perfectly. I mean, you need to have general wear and tear in the house to kind of see if things are going to stay where they're supposed to stay um, for the foreseeable future. So I would wait a few weeks before making that final payment. That way you can say, hey, I've noticed that the the rocks that you laid in the front of my house are starting to, to move and shift. Can you adjust this before I you know make that final payment? I saw an interesting statistic on Matt Lachey, Florida. It was hit by Hurricane Ian, and it stated that only 20% of people who lived on that island had flood insurance. Do you find some people are not insured? Most people will have a basic homeowner's insurance because you're not going to get a mortgage from a bank unless you have that coverage. And coastal cities, most will also require that separate flood insurance. So that statistic that you just said was is really interesting because a lot of banks will require that flood insurance. Of course, it's expensive. Inland, you're not necessarily going to have flood insurance unless you're on a floodplain. I mean, you can always buy it extra, but again, very expensive. The one thing that with storms, you will have coverage for wind-driven rain, not for flooding if you're inland typically with home insurance, which means if you get like a leaky roof or something because of the storm, you'll normally be covered. But you have to have that coverage um, because as we know, especially right now, the climate is getting more volatile. So it's important to have it. So there's no way around it, right? No way around getting insurance. Getting insurance. No, you should get it because, and you you know, be be a stickler with your policy and review your policy. Get insurance and make sure you have the type of coverage that you want. Your insurance agent should be happy and willing to answer all your questions. How critical is that, knowing what's in your insurance policy? I mean, knowledge is power. And especially in a situation that is dire with the storm, it's important to know what you're going to have covered or not covered and then plan accordingly. And then if you think, you know what, I do live really close to uh, the coastline, or I live in an area that didn't used to see flooding, but is now starting to see some more flooding. Maybe I should arm myself with that extra flood insurance. The biggest mistake 
people make after a storm when their house is damaged? What is it? I think not handling it immediately. I know that it's a stressful time, but you need to kind of, again, take the emotion out of it. I keep saying this because I, you know, I'm, I have a big heart and it's a stressful time. Take the emotion out of it. Take the pictures, call your insurance agent, get it handled. And day by day, bite by bite, it will get better. And you need to get it fixed because you're not the only one with damage. You're not the only one who's calling your insurance agent or your contractor or a contractor. Everybody is. So if you're on the ball, you can get the situation fixed a lot faster. So you're saying don't procrastinate. Don't procrastinate. I I hope people aren't during these situations, but I think it's easy to do because there's so much to deal with. But just, yeah, be proactive. And the while whoever is listening to this, whenever you're listening to it, Today is the day to think, how would I, how will I handle this if and when it happens? So that way, you're ready to go. Keely said, today is the day. <laughs> yes. I wish we could continue this conversation. Keely, thank you so much thank for you. taking time out of your schedule. I know you're so, so busy. And thanks again for listening to the WRL Daily Download and making us part of your morning routine. Another great way to get WRL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email that's waiting in your inbox every morning with triangle news, events, and headlines to get you ready for the day. Sign up at WRL.com backslash newsletter. Newsletter.